Hello, and finally get to Fort King here. Uh, this is one of the most important forts in Seminole War history in Florida, and we're glad that the property is saved and they're building a reproduction of the fort. So I want to get into the history, but it's going to take me about three sessions here on YouTube because there's just so much information, so much that went on here. So I'm just going to cover the establishment of Fort King, or it was a uh, cantonment king at first in 1827. Well, to uh, back up here, uh, Fort King, of course, is uh, in Ocala on Fort King Road. Yes, the road's named after the fort. The people that live there always knew that. <laughs> it's just in the last five years. They've been uh, starting to re rebuild the fort. And so you imagine why history is a, uh, I guess, a image here, a graphic made, I think it is in the 1890s, attack on Fort King by Indian forces under Osceola. Well, it never happened this way. <laughs> the fort never looked like that. And it, it was rare to have a, a direct attack on the fort by a Native American force. There's uh, one or two Indian braves who would shoot at the Sentinels, but more about that another time. So first off, the Treaty of Multi Moultrie Creek in 1823 defined the Indian boundary or the Indian reservation boundary from uh, south of what is today uh, uh, Micanopy area on south to Charlotte Harbor. Uh, the borders were really undefined, as you can see here. It's, I mean, they're putting a border over an area that really has never been surveyed 20 miles from the coast. I mean, nobody lives at that portion there. So you have uh, Micanopy's the furthest inland settlement, and Tampa Bay's, uh, I guess, the uh, furthest inland on the southern end. So they find out as everything went on, as I talked about some earlier history, uh, that there was a famine going along in Florida, and they decided that the Indians did not have any arable land to grow crops. So they extended the northern boundary twice of the Indian reservation. And that posed a big problem because there's Spanish land grants that the United States is still trying to verify a lot of the records went down to Cuba and never returned. They're, they're still down there. And so there's a big court process to verify the land grants that they needed at least two witnesses in court. And all of a sudden you have the reservation taking up some of those former land grants. Like I think Moses Levy might have lost a portion of what he had for his settlement. And in fact, Moses Levy eventually left when the Second Seminole War started. His uh, son, David Levy Uly, became state senator. So the boundaries kind of undefined, and they wanted to establish a military outpost on the Indian reservation to keep the settlers and the Indians from fighting against each other. Uh, Fort King or Camp King was really established to keep them apart because the settlers were raiding the Indians and the Indians were raiding the settlers mainly because they didn't have any food. The Indians were promised food, but the government's slow to provide and greatly underestimated the task at hand and the amount of food needed. So at first they established a fort, uh, Fort Duval or Camp Duval on the, near the mouth of the Swanee River, which I have a previous video I did on that and commanded by Captain Francis Dade. Uh, of course, we recognize that name. And it was abandoned after a few months uh, because it was really ineffective. It wasn't near either the settlements or the natives. So that, and they closed that and Captain Dade recommended they establish a fort at the uh, uh, near the Indian agency that they established at the Northern Reservation, which General Clinch agreed and uh, recommended that as well. 
So the uh, Indian agency was established near what's today Ocala, and they built a military road from Tampa Bay to to the Indian agency, what they called the Fort King Road later on. And uh, excuse me. And made Major or Captain Francis Day would assist on the construction of that on the road they'd be killed on 10 years later. So anyway, this is the a reservation boundary. And it's really not very uh, surveyed out. So they sent a surveyor, Joshua Coffey, and yes, uh, related to John Coffey, who rode with Andrew Jackson in the Creek War and First Seminole War. Uh, Joshua Coffey is a surveyor. Not all that good, good one either. Here's a map he made of surveying around the Indian agency. And the Indians don't care for surveyors because it usually means their land's going to be divided and sold. So interesting. You have a foul town up here. You have, looks like Mikasukis. Uh, you have Sil Silver Springs here. And you have some Indian villages. Oh, uh, on the southern end and the road going to Tampa Bay. You have the Indian Agency right there. It's three miles from the spring and right north of it is Camp McKinney named after Thomas McKinney, who was the Indian agent. That's probably what became Canton McKinney or Fort King. And here's the Indian Agency that they, uh, the plans for it from the Florida Territorial Papers and Indian Affairs Papers that they established in 1825. A very nice building, has the dimensions, kind of a four square house with a dog trot through the middle. I really would have loved to see that uh, recreated. So that's pretty cool. And then they had to clear the river because let's go back to the map. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the only way with the Indian agency up here, the only way to get to it is a long way around from Jacksonville to Black Creek and the roads down to Micanopy to the Indian agency, quite a long route, or there's the river route. But the problem was, is that the river was not cleared out. So this is an estimate of cost of Governor Duvall, estimating it cost $400. Uh, back then, uh, right now, it'd prob probably be something, I don't know, a couple million dollars. Uh, um, and this took several years to actually accomplish to clear the river. Uh, if anybody's seen a river in Florida that's not cleared for boating, it's, it's quite an obstacle course. And you can see here, $400 total. And it Finally, fi took a couple years really to clean the river out to get boats on there. You can see when Fort King finally was established, it becomes the crossroads from all different directions. You have the road down to down to Tampa Bay here, a uh, road heading south, and one going north to Micanopy. There's Humphreys Plantation. Okay. Yeah, that's probably Micanopy right there. And, of course, then here's the road to Fort McKay, which is in the center of the Ocala Forest, what we now call Fort McCoy. And Fort Fowl crossing the Okawaha River right here. This is a later map, about 1839. So uh, Fort King was important. It was not only the... Uh, headquarters of the Indian Agency in Florida, uh, where all the correspondence was going back and forth. The Indian Agency also had a post office and a postmark stamp. You can see some of that in the territorial papers and the Indian Affairs. That was the crossroads of the Seminole War. And here's the first post returns from, uh, let me see, going on my notes from March. 1827, uh, two companies from Tampa Bay come up and occupy the fort in February 
1827. And it shows uh, present or absent, uh, total present 82. Uh, there's nobody sick, nobody's died. <laughs> Just all the remark as a saying, hospital steward employed in building the quarters, which company's doing that. Uh, so this would be the 4th Infantry. It says Company F and Company H. And on the flip side, they would have the officers present. It has a surgeon. Uh, and, uh, well, oh, I, anyway, <laughs> I, I'd have to magnify that to read it. But Captain James Gassel of the 4th Infantry is commanding of the post. And he commands Fort King for the first two years of its life uh, until right before it's abandoned. 4th Infantry Companies F and H, 87 men aggregate present, both companies employed in building the buildings. Going on to the next month, April 1827, you had uh, the sergeant died. May 1827, one private deserted, one sergeant sent in per pursuit, 13 soldiers working on clearing the Okawaha River, number of soldiers present at the post, and May is 70 due to other special details and bringing supplies from Tampa, Fort Brook. So, yeah, either come down the road from uh, Micanopy or come up from Tampa Bay, Fort Brook. It's at least 100 miles either way. Very expensive to transport supplies. June 1827, uh, one private uh, deserted. The previous month was apprehended. The musician and two other privates deserted. And three men were discharged from the army by the surgeon's certificate. Now, think of that. Three men deserted from Fort King. Where are you going to go? The, the nearest settlement about 30 miles away is Micanopy or Tampa Bay. You're all through Indian country. You're making yourself quite a target. I don't know where they would go. Then the next month in July 1827, the three are apprehended, according to the post returns. <laughs> it doesn't say how. Out in the middle of nowhere, where, where, where did they find them? Uh, company F leaves Fort Brook, leaving only Captain Glassell and Company H and 37 men at the post. August 1827, the post is present, supplied with provisions, but the note says miserably destitute when medicine and hospital stores. The place continues healthy as most cases are from sore feet occasioned by an insect called a chigger. On this morning, they sent the quartermaster to see what kind of wagon road can be between there and Black on the St. John's River. I guess they're still cleaning the river. On his return, J Lieutenant Joseph Seawright will again be sent down the Silver River to view it. So anyway, at this point, the uh, fort that Captain Gla Glassell wanted to build would look like this. It has a soldier's barracks, a big building in the middle, officer's quarters, two buildings underneath that. The uh, ghost buildings to the left and right named C, that would be the kitchen buildings, and A would be the powder magazines, and B is the blockhouse. Well, that was what they wanted to build, but supplies were so expensive and shortcoming that uh, this is how the fort ended up. <laughs> it, <laughs> Never w was quite according to plan. You have one blockhouse, you know, one building, I guess that's the officer's building, and a soldier's barracks, a parade ground, and a few ways in and out of the fort. They probably had the kitchens uh, outside the fort building. That was kind of common in those days. And this uh, a view that kind of verifies it. This was done by Lieutenant Henry Prince. Uh, in his book, uh, Amidst the Storm of Bullets, uh, published by the Seminole War Foundation, Diary Lieutenant Henry Prince. And you can see Fort King there in the lower left, kind of a 
strange shaped fort. And that's what it looked like. Never quite made the, and this is what it would later look like and later in history, but we'll get to that later. So September 1827, the post continues healthy, but the hospital medical department still destitute of supplies. Cases reported are principally from sore feet, occasioned by chiggers. Uh, when I was growing up, chiggers were known as those red bugs that burrow into your skin and create welts all over you. It kind of doesn't seem like the same thing that be getting your feet here. Uh, maybe that's what they called ringworms back then, because that actually used to be a real bad thing, too. Um, it said that uh, James McQueen, of who was the leader of the band that Osceola came from, it said that he died from chiggers in Cape Florida area, uh, inf inflammation of the feet. So must have been really bad. Captain Glasshole left the post for two days and returned, not able to sign the end of the month returns. But 34 men were present. Post returns for the next few months didn't have any significant changes. And so that was 1827 uh, by Dece December, 37 men present. And the post now a year old on September, or I'm sorry, <laughs> February 1828. I'm kind of reading several lines at once. It said the post is quite healthy, principal case of sickness, re reported occasion by intoxication immediately after payment. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> Recruits are much wanted to fill the company. No column in alterations to report. Lieutenant Eaton had as to the post aggregate by promotion, he is detained until another officer can relieve him. I think Lieutenant Eaton, I think he was at uh, Fort Dade on the post returns there later on in 1836. Uh, only 30 men present at the post by May 1828. That's only half a company. Uh, June 1828, no convicts at the post. That's what they have in the post return. <laughs> That's what happens when they drink too much. The place here, here too he healthy, most of the cases being accidental, whatever that means, and also present well supplied with everything but medicines and hospital stores. Now, the Camp King here was constantly trying to get building supplies. The Secretary of War in Washington considered the post as temporary. They didn't consider it permanent, this post. And so they weren't able to get the supplies and make more permanent quarters as they wanted. They tried constructing chimneys. There's a lot of lime source, a lot of limestone in the area, but it just uh, proved too inferior. And the chimneys they tried to construct it just crumbled because they were the limestone has a thick component of sand. So it just didn't work out. So uh, August 1828, uh, no convicts at the post. <laughs> September 1828, no convicts at the post. Cases of, of sickness are accidental and chronic, uh, which means either accidental sickness, I'm not sure what that is, <laughs> or chronic sickness, you know, something that's not going away. Well, I don't know why it says those are the only cases. Those seem kind of serious, whatever they were. Uh, number of soldiers at the post in February 1829, two years after the post was established, is 34. So the number kind of remained consistent to about half a company. They're just uh, down so many because of lack of recruitments. Uh, First Lieutenant Joseph Shaw is on furlough. His status as unknown, reported to have been on command. And the Army Adjutant General Roger Jones writes back and says, find out where he's at and please inform the commander of the company. Because usually on the post returns, if you say he's on furlough, you're supposed to say where. April 1829, Lieutenant Shaw is reported to be at Fort Mitchell. That is in Georgia. No, that is in Alabama. 
up along the Chattahoochee River across from Columbus, Georgia. Lieutenant Newcomb is at Flacca bringing up provisions, trying to bring them up the river, or, or maybe cart them in from Flacca if they ever built that road. Only 28 soldiers are on the post now. It's getting at the point where there's not many soldiers left to man the post. No convicts, only three convicts at other posts reported as detached service, having received an order from the adjutant of the regiment to report <laughs> them thus. They, usually the convicts they would uh, send to uh, Fort King, one of them proved so good a carpenter that they want to keep him there, <laughs> just make him a permanent carpenter. In May 1829, Lieutenant Shaw is commanding the post and Second Lieutenant Newcomb and Assistant Sergeant Hawkins, the only other officers. Uh, 29 people are at the post, including those officers, and Captain James Glassell leaves and goes up north on recruiting service. He will never return to Florida. Uh, so Captain Glassell, who established Fort King, who's been here for uh, two years and three months at this point, he finally leaves on going on recruiting and uh, he will die, uh, I think it's 1836 or 1838, while on a steamboat going to Charleston, South Carolina. So he says he'll die at sea. And June 1829, last month of the post returns before Camp King is abandoned for the next three years. Uh, Sergeant Hawkins present, Lieutenant Shaw commanding, Lieutenant Newcomb ac acting as quartermaster, Captain Glassell on recruiting duty, Lieutenant Baker at Mobile Point performing engineering duty, never joined the company, uh, 40 men present. Uh, Lieutenant Baker at Mobile Point, he's apparently working with the construction of Fort Morgan in Alabama, so. That would be finished about five years later. Sometimes after the post was abandoned, it's burned and has, has to be rebuilt, reoccupied re three years later. So that is the first two, two and a half years of Fort King. The Indian agency was an important component. I didn't cover that, but you could tell a lot about that, especially when the fort comes back into service at that point and i'll try to do some other videos on the history of what was going on because it's really too much to cover just with fort king of kind of the activities the near start of the second seminal war about 10 years earlier and of course in uh in the spring of 1832 you have the treaty of Payne's landing on the okawaha river and Fort King is reestablished soon after. I need to mention here that Fort King's named after Colonel William King, who died shortly before the fort was built. He is the former commander of the 4th Infantry Regiment. And I did another video on him on what's, what a horrible person he was. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And come on, get my video over and that's Fort Christmas behind me that's not Fort King but it'll serve for now I'll have more pictures of Fort King later on and join me next time as I continue about Fort King <laughs>